Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Padoan, live from the recording studio at ETH Zurich. This podcast is supported by the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation, which you can check following the link in the description. Today's episode breaks the ice with the history of control theory. We will dig into the roots of the science of feedback. We will discuss some of the most iconic ancestors of control. First, we're going to talk about water clocks developed by Tisibius a Greek inventor and mathematician who lived in the 3rd century BC, and whose fame at the time rivaled that of a genius like Archimedes. Then we're going to talk about the earliest known thermostat, which was originally designed by a Dutch alchemist in the 17th century in an attempt to turn lead into gold. And finally, we're going to talk about governors. And I don't mean politicians here, but a class of mechanical devices which, without exaggeration, have enabled the first industrial revolution in Britain. Our first story today concerns water clocks, designed by Tisibius. He was an inventor who lived in Alexandria, in the ancient Hellenistic state of Ptolemaic Egypt, in the first half of the 3rd century BC. Very little is known about his life, but what we do know is that he started his career as a barber. Tazibius had the natural talent for building mechanical devices of all sorts. For example, he invented a counterweight adjustable mirror to help customers appreciate his haircutting skills. Most of modern plumbing owes a lot to Tazibius. He is credited with creating the first pump, about which he wrote a whole treatise, a water organ, and several kinds of catapults. This talent didn't go unnoticed and led him to become a proper mechanician under King Ptolemy II. Wikipedia lists Tesibius as possibly the first head of the Museum of Alexandria. The museum was one of the major cultural attractions in the Mediterranean at the time. It was literally the institution of the muses, and so was the home of music, poetry, a philosophical school, and a famous library, which at the time was possibly the largest of the ancient world. Anyways, at this stage you may wonder, why should we be interested in Tesibius's water clocks? Well, Tesibius is credited with inventing the first automatic device exploiting feedback, namely a self-regulating water clock. You have to think that measuring time in ancient Greece was no easy business. In ancient times, the sun was used to measure the time during the day, but as the night approached, sundials weren't much help anymore. So people around the world invented water clocks that used dripping water to mark the hours. The idea was to measure the passage of time by means of a small trickle of water flowing into a tank. As the water level rose, an indicator riding on the water was used to measure time. For this reason, Ancient Greeks called their water clocks klepsidras, which literally translates to water thief, and comes from the fusion of kleptain, to steal, like in kleptomaniac, and hudor, water, like in hydraulics. The main problem with most water clocks was that the speed of emptying would gradually decrease as the reservoir of water propelling the drive mechanism emptied. This is simply because a shallow level of water provides less pressure than a high level. So effectively, a clock would slow down as the reservoir of water emptied. Tesebius solved the problem of maintaining the trickle of water flowing at a constant rate by inventing a regulating valve that resembles those of modern carburetors. The regulating valve comprised of a float in the shape of a cone, which fit its nose into a mating inverted funnel. Within the regulating valve, water flowed from the funnel stem over the cone and into the bowl where the cone swam in. The cone would then float up into the concave funnel and constrict the water passage, thus throttling its flow. 
So as the water diminished, the float would actually sink, opening the passage again and allowing more water in. The feedback mechanism implemented by the regulating valve would therefore automatically seek a compromise position. It would let just enough water for a constant flow through the metering valve vessel. Perhaps the best way to understand this mechanism is to think about a curious heritage of Tezibius' device, which is a constant presence in most of our homes. The flush toilet. Tezibius' floating valve is indeed the predecessor of the floating bowl in the upper chamber of the porcelain throne. After a flush, the floating bowl sinks with the declining water level, pulling open the water valve with its metal arm. The incoming water fills the vessel again, raising the bowl triumphantly so that its arm closes the flow of water at the precise level of full. So, every time you use a modern flush toilet, think about the fact that it exploits an ingenious device which dates back to the 3rd century BC. Our second story today concerns one of the major yet invisible applications of control, heating. Every day we regulate the temperature of our rooms via a basic device that we call the thermostat, a device that was invented by the Dutch alchemist Cornelis Drebbel during the Dutch Golden Age. Like Tezibius, Drebbel was a polymath. By the time he built the first ever thermostat, Drebbel was already regarded in Europe as the Thomas Edison of his times. He had already enchanted royalty with firework displays, harpsichords that played on solar energy, and even what is thought to be the first navigable submarine. According to an account by Francis Bacon, Drebbel invented the thermostat only incidentally, while he pursued one of the highest goals of alchemy, turning base metals like lead into noble metals like gold. Drebbel was born in 1572 in Alkmaar, a relatively small town in the north of Holland. After some years at the Latin school in Alkmaar, he attended the academy in Harlem, under the supervision of Hendrik Goltzius, an engraver, painter and alchemist, who is said to have lost an eye in an alchemical experiment gone wrong. Drebbel married one of Goltzius's sisters, and initially started his career working as a painter, engraver and cartographer. But he was in constant need of money because of the prodigal lifestyle of his wife, Around 1604, Drebbel and his family moved to England, probably at the invitation of the new king, James I. Drebbel quickly became a favorite entertainer at court, with recurrent displays of his ingenious inventions, like the perpetual motion clock, which was able to tell the time, date and season, while being actuated only by atmospheric pressure and temperature. Drebbel's inventions became so famous that Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor invited him to Prague on two occasions, in 1610 and 1619. But the turbulent political situation in Prague saw him arrested on both occasions, and it was only through royal interventions from England that Drebbel managed to be released. Perhaps one of his coolest inventions was the first navigable submarine, the so-called diving boat, which he completed in 1620. It was basically a wooden vessel, propelled by oars and sealed against the water by a covering of greased leather. The diving boat was able to travel the river Thames at a depth of 4 meters from Westminster to Greenwich. Drebbel was so confident about his invention that he even took the king on a test dive beneath the Thames, which makes King James I the first monarch to travel underwater. But let us go back to Drebbel's thermostat. Drebbel believed that he could achieve his alchemical goals if he only could keep the temperature of a furnace constant for a sufficiently long time. With this goal in mind, Drebbel created the first thermostat, in the form of an L-shaped glass tube filled with alcohol that was topped off by mercury. The mechanism by which the thermostat worked was very ingenious. There was a metal rod floating in the quicksilver, so when the heated alcohol expanded, it pushed up the quicksilver and the rod rose in the tube. The rising rod in turn pressed on a lever arm, which adjusted the size of a vent at the top of the furnace. Much like the flames can be controlled by the aperture of a chimney, 
The fire that heated Drebbel's furnace was tempered by the size of the vent hole at the top of the oven, which in turn was managed by the rising and falling rod, creating a proper feedback loop. As the temperature in the apparatus rose, the increased pressure of the heated alcohol pushed up the mercury, which in turn pushed up the rod, creating a mechanical force that would close the damper and throttle down the fire. Conversely, if the temperature in the apparatus fell below the desired level, the alcohol pressure was reduced, the mercury dropped and the mechanical linkage opened the damper. Drebbel's apparatus gained the attention of several members of the Royal Society, including Robert Boyle, one of the fathers of modern chemistry, and Christopher Wren, the greatest English architect of his time. Yet, despite his success, Drebbel could never make enough money to make up for the lavish lifestyle of his wife. Drebbel passed away practically a pauper in London on 7th of November 1633. After his death, Drebbel's apparatus was finally repurposed into an artificial egg incubator to hatch chickens, perhaps in an attempt to prove that his machine could transmute inanimate matter into a living organism. From today's point of view, Drebbel's thermostat was a technological marvel. His story shows us how feedback was instrumental to generate a ubiquitous device in our everyday lives and a paradigm-shifting idea in the history of technology. Our final story today is about governors, the early ancestors of modern cruise control. Ever since their invention, at about the time of the American Revolution, governors have attracted the interest of many influential figures in science, including James Watt, Leon Foucault, and James Clerk Maxwell. Let's start by busting a myth. James Watt, who is often credited with inventing the steam engine, actually did not. Working steam engines had been on the job for decades before Watt ever saw one. In 1763, Watt was asked to repair a small-scale model of an early working Newcomen engine, which belonged to the University of Glasgow. Watt had been working for the university on maintaining and repairing scientific instruments since 1757. The Newcomen engine barely worked, even after every repair. Frustrated by the awkwardness of the engine, Watt set out to improve it. After much experimentation, Watt demonstrated that on every cycle, about three quarters of the thermal energy of the steam was being consumed in heating the engine cylinder. Watt came up with this key innovation in May 1765. He dramatically improved the efficiency of the existing Newcomen engine by separating the heating chamber from the cooling chamber. However, this innovation made his engine extremely powerful. So powerful that this generated a new problem. He needed some kind of speed regulating device to tame this unprecedented machine power. Again, Watt turned to what already existed, namely a clumsy centrifugal regulator invented by the English mechanic and miller Thomas Med. Med had invented a centrifugal regulator for a windmill that would lower the millstone onto the grain only when the stone speed was sufficient. At the time, many famous British mechanical engineers began their careers as millwrights. Governors were indeed invented to protect millstones from excessive wear and tear and to produce flour of uniformly fine quality. The idea behind Med's device was to measure the millstone's rotational speed through a whirling pendulum so as to adjust the area of the windmill sails through appropriate mechanical connections and to keep the wheel rotating at a desired speed. Centrifugal governors were immediately greeted with gratitude by James Watt and his partner Matthew Bolton, who at the time were pioneering the new technology of the steam engine. Watt and Bolton were building a large mill, later to be named the Albion Mill, where the capabilities of their new rotary engine were to be demonstrated. In May 1788, Bolton found that a device similar to that invented by Med had been installed at the Albion Mill. 
Bolton promptly sent a detailed and enthusiastic description of the device to Watt, which probably sparked the Eureka moment behind the invention of the first centrifugal governor. By November of the same year, Watt and his colleagues had designed a centrifugal speed regulator and around the end of the year, the first governor was installed on the LAP engine. Curiously, Watt did not file a patent application for the governor. He considered the device merely an adaptation of the centrifugal pendulum to a new use. However, Watt and Bolton tried to protect their invention from competitors by keeping its existence secret. In fact, the first customers who ordered it were asked to hide the governor from public view. However, the device soon became well known. Within a few years after its invention, it was recognized everywhere as a symbol of the steam engine. It is reported that about 75,000 governors were used in Britain around 1868, just 80 years after their invention. Theoretical investigation of governors started with the paper by Maxwell in 1868, which is considered to be the origin of control theory. Maxwell's interest in governors reflected, to some extent, a contemporary vogue. At the height of the Industrial Revolution, the mechanism for controlling the speed of every steam engine was plagued by problems of instability. Maxwell's interest in governors was probably unrelated to their practical utility, but originated from the desire to address the issue of their stability. He analyzed linearized models, finding that the stability of the closed-loop system could be determined by analyzing the roots of an algebraic equation. Maxwell also demonstrated the benefits of the integral action and derived a stability criterion for third-order systems. However, he had to turn to his colleague Edward Routh, who solved the general stability problem in 1877. Since 1868, governors soon entered the textbooks and handbooks of engineering, and inventors began to develop feedback devices in other areas of technology. There is a funny anecdote here about Maxwell and Routh. Routh was one of the most famous and successful coaches at Cambridge in the 19th century. He had been a private tutor to more than 600 pupils between 1855 and 1888. He prepared the senior wrangler, the top mathematics student at Cambridge, on 27 occasions. Routh was himself senior wrangler in 1854. Maxwell sat for the mathematical tripos in the same year and was placed second. Apparently, Maxwell was so confident of achieving first place himself that he did not trouble to rise early to hear the list of successful candidates read out in the Senate House but sent his servant instead. On his return, Maxwell is said to have inquired, well, tell me who's second, and he was somewhat taken aback to receive the reply, you are, sir. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.